Hey guys, I'm uh, on board the fishing vessel Nostromo. Uh, we've been fishing out of some spot, I think it's out by the Western Aleutians, called LV426. I'm not sure what we're after, something xenomorph, some, I don't know what it is we're after here. Um, but anyway, it, it's, uh, it's been, it's been alright. I'm supposed to be at work right now, um, uh, but one of the crew can't find his cat, so they sent me down here to find it. Uh, not sure what I'm supposed to be looking for. Um, but anyway, the first question uh, is from the always wonderful Tatiskin72, who wanted to know um, if I ever have to worry about death threats. And the answer to that is no. Actually, uh, the penalties for even implied threats to me are, are very, very stiff. And fishermen here know all, they say, everybody knows uh, how stiff the penalties are. But really, uh, most of the time, the, the other, if the other issue is that people just don't talk to me at all. Um, so, you know, it's just kind of annoying. Um, but no, death threats really aren't, aren't a problem. I mean, obviously there are, there are issues that come up uh, there's always somebody, but not with, I have yet to even make sure any hostility whatsoever. So anyway, I gotta get back to, I gotta find this cat. So um, I will go on to the next question. Next question by Ochihuahua. Uh, asked, how do you sex a fish? Well, given the, the heritage of the town that I'm uh, working out of right now, uh, Dutch Harbor, uh, I'd say the obvious answer would be, in Soviet Russia, fish sex you. Take your stinking claspers off me, you damn dirty skate. But seriously, um, actually, for most fish species, uh, to determine sex, you have to actually dissect them. You open them up. Um, with bony fish at least. The, when you, you have to cut the belly open and then you look for the gonads. Um, the shape, color, um, egg or sperm development of the gonads will determine whether or not it's a male or female. Um, I, well, I'll show you an example here. The gonads of bony fishes lie in the dorsal portion of the visceral cavity directly below the kidney. The kidney can be seen here as a light purple part. Uh, directly below that, you see a, the orange mass of eggs. This obviously is a female. Um, now, the eggs in this case aren't very ripe. As they ripen, they'll, they'll grow in size and eventually fill most of the visceral cavity. Um, if you contrast that with a male, you can see the here are the testes, uh, the white portion, um, pink, light pink, almost white. Um, and again, those will grow in size as as reproductive season approaches. All right, next question is by Pilgrim Pater. He wanted to know about uh, the Atlantic and what I know about their recovery. Um, as it turns out, I don't know a whole lot. I, I did look up some information on it uh, prior to making the video where I was discussing cod. Um, and as far as I understand it, the um, there are several populations of Atlantic cod. Um, distinct reproductive groups and the northernmost groups uh, those in the far north Atlantic um, are still doing poorly they have not recovered those stocks are still considered uh, economically extinct I mean they're still cod but they're not in any numbers uh, to make fishing worthwhile uh, populations a little bit further south like off the United States apparently are doing okay um, they're still fished uh, those the stocks have been fairly well managed and they were never, apparently from what I was able to, to read, they were never hit as hard as the populations up off Canada and, um, and Europe. So the, the, the population off the United States wasn't, wasn't as badly, it didn't crash like the more northern population did. So. D. Landon Cole asked, how did the fishers react when I filmed a bit about the cod? Um, that being in an earlier video where I recreated a scene from The Wrath of Cod. At least that's, I'm assuming, what he's, what he's referring to. Um, in reality, the, the people that I work with, the fishermen and processors that I work with, uh, they see me doing all kinds of weird shit all the time. Um, I'm cutting things, weighing things, whatever. And so my guess is that it's just kind of one more weird thing that I'm doing, although the actual uh, talking cod bit got a lot of laughs and... Um, it kind of became the thing to do for the day with everybody. They were all making their fish talk. So I started a trend at least for the hour after I did that. So um, much, much laughter to be had by all, actually.
Stromatolite775 wanted to know how is the fishing industry around ADAC. Uh, I apologize. For, this is going to go on, by the way. Um, I'm sort of paraphrasing these questions. I wrote down uh, sort of brief my versions of them. So I may have some of the questions wrong. And if this is not the question anyone asked, I apologize in advance. Um, but you'll see that throughout the rest of this, this Q&A. Um, but anyways, uh, how is the fishing industry around ADAC? Uh, I don't really know. Uh, we, I'm in the e the eastern Aleutians. Um, I'm actually not at all out in the western Aleutians. Unfortunately, I'd love to get back out there again, um, but I I'm not. I do know that um, I, I re encountered other people in my field or my my job who uh, do work out of ADAC at least occasionally. And so there's there's obviously a fishing industry going on out there. Um, but I have to believe it's um, not as large as the as the eastern eastern Bering Sea, eastern Aleutians, uh, like the pollock or cod or crab fishery here. That that's just my guess. So I don't I don't really know. And I will not make it out to ADAC this year. Um, my hope is uh, two thousand and twelve I will be working in ADAC again. So at least that's my hope. Frederick F. and Umu45 both asked about the 50-50 sex ratio. Um, my assumption is that what they're asking is why do we see pretty much uh, across the board, um, I mean, there are exceptions of course, but we see there tends to be 50% males and 50% females um, in, in plants, animals, fungi. Uh, we see this, it's very, very common. Um, and, and, and now that that's, that's actually produced. Now we might see it, a different ratio that actually reaches sexual maturity or actually reaches adulthood or what they call operational sex ratio, which hopefully I'll get to here if I can be brief on this. Um, this is a great question. I love, I love this kind of stuff. Um, probably the simplest answer, and there's a whole lot of answers to this. I'm not going to get to, to even a fraction of them. Um, there, are, there are probably multiple reasons why, um, multiple causes why. With something that's that widespread, you wouldn't expect it to be as simple as, well, here's why. Um, but probably the, the most common, most likely scenario is in a lot of species, most of a species, there's some kind of uh, sex chromosome. There's some kind of, in, in mammals, of, you know, we, we have the, the XY um, sex chromosomes, for example. And so that's one, um, from, a, from simply looking at it from, you know, the selfish gene perspective, if a male produces an offspring that's female, um, it's 50% of his genome, but not quite, because the, you will have none of the genes on his Y chromosome are going to be transmitted. So the, the, goal of, the goal of reproduction is to pass on the maximum percentage of your genome as possible, um, even if it's a little fraction that you're missing out on. So there might be a selective pressure. And at the same time, females are also, you know, there's males would, obviously, thinking of this not in, in, in terms of intent, but from a, from a pure evolutionary perspective, males would want to produce all male offspring. Obviously, that wouldn't function in a species, but it, it, remember, we're not, there's no group selection. Um, nothing happens for the good of the species. Um, it's reproductive success of the individual. So a male is attempting to maximize his fitness, passing on as much of his genome as possible, including the genes on that sex chromosome. At the same time, females are countering this. So you might, you might, you might sort of think that a 50-50 ratio is sort of a good compromise between these two opposing Intersexual select, intersexual selective forces, if that makes sense. Um, that that's that's kind of a real simple answer. Um, but like one of the things that we see in, in like again in uh, in a lot of species is we'll see fifty percent male female are produced, gametes are produced, um, embryos are produced, zygotes or whatever, um, but not fifty percent survive or not 50% reach sexual maturity, or if 50% do reach sexual maturity of one or the other sex, um, only a fraction of those actually reproduces things like uh, sea lions, where, where just a, you know, something like 5% of all of the males 
only will ever reproduce in their lifetime. So I, I, I might be wrong on the number on that, but basically, um, 50, there's 50% 50 of the population's male and female, but only a tiny fraction of the males are ever going to reproduce. So they have a very small operational sex ratio. So the question would be, why not, why waste the energy producing all these males? Um, and again, probably the sex chromosome, uh, genes on the sex chromosome, um, they, uh, attempting to reproduce themselves. And, and again, don't don't read intent into this, okay? I'm, I'm talking about it when you look, kind of do a numbers game on it. Uh, but also, there's probably a lot more. I mean, you know, you think of a, a male produces 50% of his offspring knowing only a small fraction of his male offspring are going to reproduce. Um, but if he produced less than a smaller percentage of that, it, kind of a thing. You might think of males, you know, intersexual, or intrasexual selection. Holy crap, I can't get that right today. Um, you know, if one male is producing 25% males, so he produces a lot more females, well, then that's that many more females for another male to, to potentially impregnate with his 75% males that he's going to produce or something like that. So, you know, it. hopefully that made some sense. But anyway, it's a really, really complex question. There's If I think about it, um, I'll put links down below. Um, but you know what? You know, look it up yourself. I'm not your research tool. I'm, I'm that bad. Bad joke. I apologize. I I uh, I'll be your tool. Um, I'll I'll look up a couple of papers on it. There's a few pretty landmark papers from the 70s, I believe, on on the subject uh, that sort of address the the numbers game in, in this. And I will I will I'll put links in. So okay. Um, oh, and also Frederick F asked, where are my car keys? Um, actually, there there's there's a little uh, nightstand by your bed. They fell down behind there. The Lobos Jordan asks if I if I believe if uh, if I believe that atheism or atheists will become the majority in the U.S. and Europe. Uh, I'm not really qualified to talk on that question. Um, I can I can speculate about the United States, uh, but I don't think so. I don't really think. I mean, I think that atheism is certainly on the rise. It's um, maybe not even on the rise as much as. Um, it's a whole lot more socially acceptable to be an atheist. The, the, the general public is becoming more and more aware that atheists are out there and um, not maybe not, you know, the dark, evil, pedophile communists that they were thought to be. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think that it, you'll certainly see a lot more atheism, a lot more, hear a lot more about it. It'll become a lot more commonplace, a lot more acceptable. But I don't think it's going to become a majority. Uh, what my hope is, in reality, if I had a wish, um, is to see the United States at least go a whole lot more in the secular direction that Europe has, where there's um, lots and lots of theists, lots of people, Christians and of Muslims, Jews, Buddhists, whatever the whole the whole theistic spectrum, um, but not as. Uh, it's a little less important in their lives than it is than it appears to be um, to um, what we see in America, American theists. That's that's my. Um, but I, again, this this is the hard part. This is the this is the my hesitation in predicting such things because you can't look at a, a trend in something or what appears to be a trend in something because that's the hard part too. Um, remember, a lot of times these things, it's is it, it it's what's being reported, um, you know as opposed to what's actually occurring. Something can be said, it's on the rise only because it's being reported more often. You see that in a lot of crime statistics. Um, and so with atheism, is it really any more common or is it just being talked about more? That kind of a thing. But what I have seen in, in what, or what's gone on in historically at least, is you see uh, sort of progressive issues gain some headway um, and then they can turn back. Um, the pendulum can swing back really, really hard the other direction. And so I'm really hesitant to say, well, this is what's going to happen. Um, I, 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 I don't have the, I don't have the book with me. I don't have any of my, my good books with me. But um, I have a, a book by a Havelock Ellis. Um, and Havelock Ellis is talking about how, you know, 
scientists are starting to understand that you know homosexuality is just a normal part of the human sexual spectrum and and that he was I think was he said that by 1930 um, homosexuality will have no more importance in our society than hair color or eye color or something like that he made a, it was a, it was a, a quote like that essentially you know predicting that with the you know as, as people are coming to accept it it'll become completely unimportant to how we treat people obviously you know 80 years later we're not there yet so you know that kind of thing and i it, it's entirely possible that by you know 2020 we could be a militant christian society where atheists don't dare speak up i mean something like that could could happen and i i don't know i hope it's not true but i'm i'm hesitant to to make those kinds of predictions um he also asked um the lobos jordan asked about my favorite book um that's a really hard question to answer for me because I've got a lot of favorite books, um, but I have to say Dune. Um, in terms of books that I return to and reread regularly, um, I love the, especially the first one. Um, but I love the first, the first three, very much. Um, but the first, the the original Dune by Frank Herbert, I've read more times than I can count. Um, I it's 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 just beautiful from some start to finish it's it's like a vacation for me in my head